Good evening. Well, I hope you're as excited as, as I am. I, I look forward to that time that we can meet together uh, in the building. I told Troy, uh, I guess I need to just tell people uh, if I start to come up to you with my arms open and you don't want me to get too close or to hug you, just do this and I'll, I'll back off. Uh, I'm a hugger and uh, I, I miss my church family and I, I look forward to that time that, that we can meet together. Um, it's been good to experience this. We're truly blessed to have Brother Troy and, and his expertise in this field so that we can... Uh, you know, live stream, I, you know, if, if, it, if it was me doing the preaching, I would probably just have to tell you, you know, uh, do, your, do your little service yourself with your family because th this is amazing to me with all these wires and, and computer boards and everything. I just sit back and go, wow. So uh, make sure you thank Brother Troy for his time and energy that... Uh, He's put into um, allowing us to, to still worship uh, live stream. You know, every single one of these lessons that I have done have meant something to me. Um, they, they say that when you do lessons, you know, you're, most of the time you're talking to yourself. And they, they have helped me to refocus on some things that I need to refocus on. And, you know, to give me some courage and some, some strength. But tonight we're going to be talking about the problem of time. 24 hours in a day, 168 hours in a week, 730 hours in a month, 8,760 hours in a year, 87,600 in a decade, and 876,000 in a century. That, that's a lot of time, you know, and when you look at it like that, you know, in a year's time, 8,760 hours, it doesn't seem like, you know, when you think about it, and that, that don't sound like that's a whole lot of time. But one thing about time, it stands still for no one. And, you know, we can't ever go back and relive even a second that we've already lived. Once it's there, it's gone. Um, time is a valuable commodity, and God has entrusted us to be good stewards of our time and what he's blessed us with. In John chapter 9 and verse 4, he says, we must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming and no one can work. In Proverbs chapter 16 and verse 9, In their hearts humans plan their course, but the Lord establishes their steps. Proverbs chapter 21 and verse 5, The plans of the diligent lead to profit as surely as haste leads to poverty. Proverbs chapter 27 and verse 1, Do not boast about tomorrow. You do not know what a day may bring. In Psalms chapter 90 and verse 12, Teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. And then the last one, Mark chapter 13, verse 32 and verse 33. But concerning that day, our hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, only the Father. Be on guard, keep awake, for you do not know when that time will come. It amazes me at the number of religious leaders that have tried to, to prove and to say when the Lord is coming back, when the end of time is coming. But no one knows. 
we need to always be ready. Time has always been a problem for man because he only has a limited amount of, time of it. The scarcity and the uncertainty of it. <clears throat> it's, a, it's, one, it's the world's most precious and irreplaceable commodity. But yet it brings a tremendous and grave responsibility, especially to the Christians, for how we use it. Our days are few and wrought with trouble. Man that is born of woman is a few days and full of trouble. Job chapter 14 verses 1 through 2. Few days which are troubled, filled, and this presents a lot of problems for you and I. Problems that are related to time. First, we have the problem of learning. <clears throat> My condition of we need to, to realize that we as humans, and being weak and delicate, we need to measure our days. I, I know that for me personally. I know it, but yet I don't know it. I know life is short, but I always think of that being for the other guy, not for me. I'm inclined to think that time will just go on and on and slow down for me. But yet in the blink of an eye, time carries on. So we need to apply that lesson to ourselves. James describes life like a vapor. We're here a little while, and then it vanishes away. It's kind of like the morning fog, you know. When it's still cool, we get that fog in, and before you know it, it's just gone. And that's the way time is. Life is something we live daily. No man's frail is a, is a daily problem. In solving it, I need to take the matter to God in prayer and to ask him for help, as did the psalmist. He said, Lord, make me to know mine, my end, and measure my days, what it is, that I might know how frail I am. Psalms chapter 39, verse 4. So teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. Psalms chapter 90 and verse 17. If we learn this, we will be smart. We have the everyday problem of protecting our body and caring for my health to the end that my days may be lengthened. The days of our years are measured three score years and ten. A score is an old term that was uh, used to track life, and it, it represents 20 years. So the days of our life is 70. And if by reason of strength but be uh, four score years and 80, or four score years, that's 80, yet there's strength and labor and sorrow. For it is soon cut off, and we fly away. That comes from Psalms chapter 90 and verse 10. By reason of strength, man's years may be increased. So man is daily duty bound to eat nutritiously, to sleep adequately, to work sensibly, to exercise sufficiently, and relax restfully. Whatever contributes to my longevity is still a daily problem, though, and I must realize it, and I must do something about it. Neither life nor time is to be taken lightly. We have the problem of redeeming time. The Holy Spirit, through Paul, says, Redeem the time, because the days are evil. Ephesians chapter 5. In verse 16, redeem means to buy back. While we have already wasted much time, we all have, we need to buy back as much as we can. Or an example, make the most of our time that we've been given here on this earth. Idleness 
is not for the Christian. The householder in the parable asks, Why stand ye here all day idle? In Matthew chapter 20 and verse 6. One problem, if not solved cor correctly, leads to others. So the sin of idleness father, fathers more sins, and withal they learn to be idle, wandering about from house to house, and do not only idle, but tattlers, also busybodies, speaking things which ought not to. 1 Timothy to chapter 15 and verse 3. Turn to Proverbs chapter 16 real quick. I want to read this in Proverbs chapter 16. We'll look at verses 26 through 33. A worker's appetite works for him. His mouth urges him on. A worthless man plots evil, and his speech is like a scorching fire. A dishonest man spreads strife, and a whisper s separates close friends. A man of violence entices his neighbor and leads him away that is not good. Whoever winks his eye plans dishonest things. He who uh, pursues his lips brings evil to pass. Gray hair is a crown of glory. It is gained in righteous living. Whoever is slow to anger is better than the mighty. And he who rules his spirit, then he can take, takes a city. The lot is cast in his lap. But every decision is from the Lord. As you can see, idleness may get to be a deadly peril. You've heard it said that the trouble with busybodies is they just have too much spare time on their hands. And if old Miss, old Miss Tattler had more to do, maybe she wouldn't have so much time to talk. We have to daily face the temptation of procrastinating until tomorrow and to do what we should do today. The Bible's great words is now and today. Now is the time, the acceptable time, 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 2. Today, if you hear his voice, Hebrews chapter 3, verses 7 and 8. Tomorrow is in the realm of the unknown. Solomon said, Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowing not what a day may bring forth. In Proverbs chapter 27 and verse 1. Tomorrow may bring sickness, may stop you in your tracks, or death. Or even though your health can favor you, tomorrow there can be a decreased interest in what you were planning on doing. Faded desires, shattered faith. Tomorrow is a fool's day. Jesus called one man a fool because he planned big things. Tomorrow at the expense of neglecting his soul today. Turn with me to Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12, we'll start in verse 16. <clears throat> the, rich, uh, the land of a rich man produced plentiful, and he thought to himself, What shall I do, for I now have to store my crops? And he said, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones, and there I will store my grain and my goods, and I will say to my soul, Soul, you have ample goods laid up for, for many years. Relax, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, Fool, 
This night your soul is required of you. The things you have prepared, whose will they be? So this is the one who lays up treasures for himself and is not rich toward God. That will make one a fool. All that tomorrow meant to him was death. Whatever intentions he may have had for self-improvement, for world betterment, they died with him. And on his tombstone, they could inscribe tomorrow. Now let's do a little soul searching about the problem of tomorrow. What, did, what about the text or the email or the call? I was going to send to a beloved friend tomorrow. Now it's been so long that I feel ashamed to do it. What about the thank you note that I was going to write tomorrow? Oh, how time flies. It's been six months. Whatever happened to that tomorrow, I was going to begin reading my Bible every day. Teach a class. And what about that apology where you hurt someone's feelings? I was going to, to make to whomever for the wrong that I had done. The bad habit that I was going to give up tomorrow. But tomorrow never comes. He was going to be all that a mortal should be tomorrow. No one would be better than he tomorrow. Each morning he stacked up his to-do list only to write tomorrow. It's too bad indeed that he was too busy to see his friend, but he promised to do it tomorrow. The greatest of workers this man would be tomorrow. The world would have known him and had he ever had ever seen anyone better tomorrow. But the fact is that he died and faded from view and all that was left when living was through was a mountains of things that he intended to do. Others have had the same problem of time. The problem of time was one of the major problems that Felix had. He failed to overcome. Paul preached to him of righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come in Acts chapter 24 and verse 5. The word had such an effect on Felix that he trembled, but he lost the battle of time. And he said, go thy way, and when I have a more convenient season, I will call for you. He waited for that convenient season, and it never came as far as we know. The foolish virgins, they were good women. There was ten of them, but five of them failed to solve the problem of time. Matthew chapter 25, if you'll turn there with me. The kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went to the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. Five, when the foolish took the lamps, they took no oil with them, but the five wise took flask of oil with their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and slept. But at midnight there was a cry, Here's the bridegroom, come out to meet him. All those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil. For we have none. But the wise answered, saying, Since there will not be enough for us and for you, go rather to the dealers and buy for yourself. And while they were going to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast, 
and the door was shut. Afterwards, the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered, Truly I say to you, I do not know you. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. <clears throat> Those virgins were in the kingdom. They wanted to meet the bridegroom. They made some preparation, but not enough. The spirit of tomorrow was the cause of their run. They went forth to make preparation, but it was too late. Time ran out on them. We can save time by not wasting it. There are many ways time is wasted. The first one is lack of application. If we accomplish things, we must apply ourselves. Solomon said, Whosoever thou findest to do, do it with all your might. Ecclesiastes chapter 9 and verse 10. Because play is easier and more fun, the child refuses to apply himself very long. But we adults, and as such should, we, we need to put away those childish things. We need to move on to maturity. Unwholesome recreation. The world is pleasure mad and is wasting time in the dizzy pursuit of the same. Lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. Second Timothy chapter 3 and verse 4. And most of their pleasures are only mirages. They look like it will quench their thirst, but it turns out only to be dried sand in their throat. Everyone needs recreation, but let's make sure it's wholesome. Meditating on past injuries is a very hurtful way to waste time. Carrying a chip on your shoulder takes both strength and time that could be used constructively. Even though the worry is real, rather than imaginary, may, meditating on it will bring only bitterness and frustration. Forget it. Leave it to the Lord. Vengeance is mine and I will repay, says the Lord in Romans chapter 12 and verse 19. Pondering our past mistakes is another way of wasting time. No accountable being is perfect. Every life has its own weaknesses. Great men have made great mistakes. Paul declared that he was the chief of sinners, but he obtained a pardon from a merciful God, and he put his past sins behind him. He said, forgetting those things that are behind me and reaching forth to those things which are before me. In Philippians chapter 3 and verse 13. When God forgets sin, he forgets it. Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 12. And so should we. Many waste time with worry. We need faith to accept the promise that God will work all things for our good. In Romans chapter 8 and verse 28. We don't know the future, but we know in whose hand the future is, our God. Turn loose of yesterday, for it's gone. Do not reach for tomorrow, for it has not come. Grab today, for it is here. Gossiping or lending ears to gossip is a sinful and a way to squander time. Thou shalt not go up and down as a talebearer among our people. In Leviticus chapter 19 and verse 16. <clears throat> Gossip is evil and it's a waste of time. The words of a talebearer are wounds. Proverbs 26 verse 22. 
No one way I can solve the problems of time is by refusing to be a part of gossip, by speaking it or even hearing it. Sometimes too much time is spent in bed. Love not sleep, lest thou come to poverty. Proverbs chapter 20 and verse 13. We all need rest and work, and we should keep the two in their proper perspective. Sometimes too much time on the phone can be a waste of time. I knew a man that would argue with you that the telephone was an instrument of the devil. This was before Facebook and smartphones and many other forms of social media. And he had a point, but I had to disagree with him. It can also be an instrument of God. However, anything that we can use to invade others' privacy whenever he wishes and hold you longer than you desire, it's an act of courtesy for me to state my business and get through with it. We need to practice a little bit of the the golden rule. Social media has a tendency to attract people many hours of the day. The exaggerated lifestyle some portray on social media is hyped and tends to make them look like something that they're not. All good things can turn bad if we allow them to consume us. Disorganization can be a, a cause of wasting time. Every day, people haphazardly run the gauntlet from A to Z without spending enough time on anything to get the job done. Organization and multitasking can get many things run much more smoothly. Then we don't spend time looking for things. Everything has a place, and all things need to be in their place. Moving in slow motion can be a way of wasting time. Paul sent for Silas and Timothy to come with all speed in Acts chapter 17 and verse 15. Abraham Lincoln was one of my favorite people, and he was known for many of his qualities, one of which was his wit. On one occasion, it was said that Abraham Lincoln went to, to rent a horse and a buggy to go to a speaking engagement. The opposition had paid the livery stable man to give him the slowest horse that he had so that he'd be late for his speech. And when Lincoln returned the horse and buggy, he stated to the livery driver, I guess you must save this horse for funerals. And the livery driver responded, No, no, surely not. And Lincoln said, Well, I'm glad to hear that, for if you did, the chances are you wouldn't get the corpse to the cemetery before the time of the resurrection. I can save time by moving faster, provided I do it according to the law. It's not a speed, it's not a pass to speed in your cars. Hesitancy in making decisions, it keeps one in a quandary. It's like being on a merry-go-round. I'm against hasty decisions, but dragging decisions on and on is not good either. The person who can never make up their mind is always behind. I'm probably going to pay for this when I get home, but my wife, when we go to the grocery store, if I go, I've got my list, I go, bang, 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 I get my items and I'm out. My wife will walk in, oh, oh, and she's here and there and everywhere, and I'm going, oh. Same way at a restaurant. Before I walk into a restaurant, most of the time I know what I'm going to order. 
I walk in. The waitress says, are you ready to order? Yes, ma'am, I am. And she'll take my order. My wife's still looking at, oh, I, I, I don't know what I want. Oh, can you give me just a little bit more time? And I think, we eat in here all the time. And she'll make a decision only when we get our plate. Oh, yours looks good. Maybe I should have got that. Can I have a bite of that? She can never make her mind up, but I love her. I must get the facts, the weighty facts, and weigh the facts out in helping to reach my decisions. Sometimes the right decision is not the easiest, but it is necessary. After prayer and meditation, you can only do your very best and then turn your decision over to God. Remember, time is the equalizer of all of life on earth. You have the same amount of time as everyone else. It just matters how you spend it. What you do with the 24 hours you are given in that day determines your success, your failure, and your contentment in life. Life is not about getting more time. It's a hard practice of managing your time that you have left. To get a better grasp on the time that you're spending, you need to ask yourself, how am I currently spending my time? How much time do we spend on frivolous things like watching TV? And how much time do we spend in prayer and studying our Bible? By far, the spiritual matter should take priority and that's what the things we should spend our time in. How can I get better at managing my time? One way is to plan your work and work your plan. We must be good stewards of however long we're given on this earth. Some are given longer than others. Some face health problems. Every day we need to get up and thank the Lord for the time that he has given us to spend on this earth. And as I said, the far more important thing is to invest in the spiritual things and not the fleshly. In Matthew chapter 6 and verse 20, the Lord tells us to lay up for yourself treasures in heaven where moth and rust destroy, don't destroy. Everything that we work for right now, one day will vanish away. The only things that will truly last is our spiritual life. And that's the things we need to invest in to spend more time in, with our brethren. Spend those times in writing those cards, making those calls, reaching out to brethren that are sick. I hope that you'll think about those things and, and do a, a self-evaluation of how you spend your time. Next week will be...